Um, it, we're now in our second part of uh, this uh, closing session, and this is the uh, round table part where uh, we will uh, have uh, new slides on the screen. Thank you very much. And um, I'm calling our uh, participants now. So uh, first of all, I would call uh, maybe in the order not in which they are uh, written. I don't see, but I know where they're sitting. So I will first call uh, Mike Milinkovic, who's the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, Mike. And perhaps a second round of applause for Mike, because it's his birthday today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next uh, participant is uh, Sandra Stricker, who is the Executive Vice President of the Apache Foundation. The next speaker is uh, G uh, Nick Olsey, who's uh, Vice President of Marketing at JasperSoft and a board member of the Open Solutions Alliance. Thank you. And of course, Jim is joining us. Thank you. And um, now I have the pleasure to call our moderator, Tony Wasserman of the Carnegie Mellon University at West Coast. Tony? Thank you. So, Tony, the discussion is yours. Here's the mic. Merci. Bon après-midi. On continue en anglais. Je le regret. Okay. Um, so, uh, what we want to talk about today is this notion of community. Community is uh, a word that everybody uses in the open source community to be a circular definition. And, and yet we all have slightly different ideas of what that means. So what I thought we would do to start out is to ask each of the panelists to describe not their notion of community, but their own community. That is, how, do they, how does the Linux Foundation work with its community? How does the Eclipse Foundation work with its community? And so, from that, then I have a few prepared questions that we can use for a discussion. But let me uh, start here with uh, Mike Milinkovic. Uh, well, actually, community is one of those words, um, the best analogy I can give, it's, it's like pornography. It, you know it when you see it, right? Um, it's, so that's a famous Supreme Court thing. I didn't make that up. <laughs> you go to RedTube instead of YouTube. Um, the, uh, Communities are essentially, you know, functioning, vo essentially volunteer-driven organizations, um, and every one of the different communities that we're representing up here um, is a different sort of di different spots along the scale between pure volunteerism and pure um, monetization. And everybody that's in the open source business, in some in some sense is doing it, there's always, you know, follow the money. There's always some rationale in behind there where it's in people's economic um, or social benefits to, uh, to, to participate in a community. And every one of these different communities, like I said, is on a different point along that spectrum. Um, at the case of Eclipse, we have a, a specific challenge because, and I was uh, reflecting on this in my talk earlier this afternoon, is um, Eclipse is really the marriage of two communities um, because there's very much a, an open, meritocratic, uh, op you know, open source community that's driving our projects and our technology forward um, in ways which are very similar to what happens in Apache and Linux and, and others. Um, but there's also a second community at Eclipse, which is in, with one of the things that's a little bit unique about Eclipse is that we have uh, a consortium. There's a business community. Um, that is explicitly part of how the Eclipse Foundation works. Um, so a big part of what my role is is also to help recruit businesses to come to Eclipse, recruit businesses to use Eclipse in their products and in their product strategy, and to learn how to participate on this project side and get engaged with, uh, with Eclipse as an open source community as well. So there's, that's one thing that's a little bit different and unique about Eclipse. Um, but like I said, every one of these, as we go through this, I'm sure you'll see every one of these communities you can plot somewhere along this trend line between pure volunteerism and, and pure monetization. 
So good, thank you. So Sander Apache is is uh, certainly uh, among the older uh, foundations. Uh, it's ten years now, right? Because Apache Con is a month from now, and that's a tenth anniversary event. Uh, and you have uh, quite a bit of governance and a huge participation. So maybe you can say a bit about that. Right. Um, well, that's interesting. Um, well, we, we are a uh, hundred percent volunteer organization, or close to it at least. Um, our entire community uh, um, is is uh, how do you say this? Um, <clears throat> um, is is working together as a whole uh, along the same lines. Um, as everyone else is. So we, we have some common rules uh, that, that everybody um, adheres to, uh, mostly in terms of communication and uh, participation. So um, I, I think that um, what we try and do is uh, keep a level playing ground for everyone uh, and keep the barrier to entry low. Um, and I think that that's one of the, the core values that you see at Apache. So, so you have a governing body, but you also have communities organized around various projects. Yeah, our uh, governance body is the membership, uh, which is about 300 people um, who elect a board on a yearly basis. Um, so it, it's not that a sitting board can sit forever, it's a yearly election. Um, and apart from that, we have about 70 projects. Uh, every project uh, you could consider as its own community, but as a whole, it's a community as well, because it's functioning in the same way. Good, thanks. So um, let's uh, to, to Nick. Um, so, so Nick, Nick is the purveyor of some news today uh, because the Open Solutions Alliance and uh, and Object o OW2 have announced uh, uh, their merger today. Uh, and uh, we can we can talk more about that as as it comes up, but uh, for for Nick, um, uh, I think uh, you could certainly say something about how um, the community in JasperSoft works because JasperSoft is a company that has both a proprietary product and a open source product. Nick and I have talked on occasion over the years about the different kinds of communities that exist. So maybe that will give you a, a lead in. One thing I'd like to say is that it, the, the difference between the OSA, I think, and the other organizations represented here is uh, most communities are organized around the development of software projects. And the OSA was formed by a group of organizations that were already had open source software projects and were more concerned about how to enhance and foster the interoperability of those projects than the development of them. Um, we have our projects hosted on our, our own forge, and there's 100,000 registered developers who participate in that community contributing to our code base. And that's working very well. But people don't use software in isolation. They use it in conjunction with a variety of other software products, some of them proprietary, uh, some of them open source. And how do we, as independent companies or organizations, foster that uh, interoperability? And one reason we decided to join forces with the OW2 is to create an even larger group of organizations that can work more together on the initiatives that bring these different projects together into solutions that are more likely to be adopted by organizations. And so that's... Um, the motivation behind what we're doing. I, I, I'd love to talk about JasperSoft itself, but I'll, I think it would be good to, to we'll, let we'll, the other. We'll come other... back to it. Uh, so, so Jim, I mean, Linux Foundation, of course, was was uh, created just a few years ago by merging uh, two uh, two other groups. But but certainly now that you have uh, perhaps the largest developer uh, organization. Uh, with uh, thousands of people who contribute to the, the Linux code base. Uh, th that, um, so what are the things that you're doing that are uh, interesting uh, about, about that community and, and how you uh, keep peace? Well, we don't keep peace very well with the Linux community. If you knew anything about the Linux community, you would know that's, that well, we don't. Well, it was just a, yeah, an opener for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think what is important about Linux as an example, it's one of, uh, it's a very early open source project. 
uh, and it's a project that has done well by marrying two things, fun and finances. Linux started out, Linus created Linux to have fun with it, and uh, it's now a huge multi-billion dollar industry. It started out as a way to share software and share code and ideas, and it's now used by every single person on the planet every single day that, that, that has access to technology. And I think that's the fundamentally interesting thing about the Linux community, is that it's taken a concept that applies social good, access to source code, principle uh, our community that our industry believes in, and has produced a sustainable and growing, fast growing economy around that. It's really married these two concepts incredibly well. And I think that's the thing that the Linux community should be most proud of, is that it's married those two things. Uh, our organization is in charge of making sure that that continues and grows, because as I previously said, Linux is only at the very beginning of a very long life in platform computing. Um, it's important to protect the freedoms that uh, have been created through the open source movement, the, the, the freedoms of being able to have access to source code, being able to be, uh, to be prevented from being locked in. And so marrying those two things, I think, are the, the big principles. And we have uh, really started to professionalize that in, in a way that's meaningful. The legal protection that we provide, the standards that we create to enable better interoperability and less lock-in, and then the mechanisms to make sure that it's still fun, that people still can share code and ideas and enjoy that, and that someone working on a Linux cell phone trying to get more battery life can share that idea with someone in a data center who wants to reduce their cooling and power footprint. We want to make sure that happens and we have mechanisms to do that at our, our foundation. So um, Cedric, um, with OW2 you have uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, funding and you have various projects. It, it, there's some similarity with the uh, uh, Apache Software Foundation's organization, uh, at least on the surface. Maybe you can explain a little bit about how OW2's community has worked. Well, I must say that uh, OW2, we're very humble here in this, uh, this round table, and we look at these organizations as a model to be followed. Uh, we look at Eclipse as the uh, key model to build business ecosystems. We look at Apache as the key reference model how to manage community. And we look at uh, Linux Foundation as the reference model how to manage uh, and drive technology progress. But if you want to understand uh, OW2, you have to uh, think that we are the sequel of a previous organization that was called Object Web and that was founded in 2001, and that was more of um, uh, mechanically driven. So really we were probably more like the Apache Foundation in that sense where uh, um, the, the membership was essentially, uh, came essentially from, uh, from the academic world. And then uh, we, uh, but Object Web was just a, a three-year project. So at the end, the idea was either we pull the plug or not. And to understand what OW2 is today, you have to understand that we are a second generation um, uh, organization. So we thought of uh, what we were doing. We literally did a development plan or business plan, if you like, and we realized that uh, there was a, this kind of opportunity for a commercial open source. And our membership is uh, both, uh, includes both uh, individuals, many from a academia and some, uh, and many uh, commercial organizations. So one thing I would like to say to the to the question by the community, when uh, uh, Mike, you said uh, you don't know what, a com what is a community, I mean, but you recognize one when you see it. It's, uh, um, we've been do doing some thinking about it, and uh, I think we, sh we have the notion of community model, and we've been started working on the community model because we want to, do, to be proactive. And the community model is pro for us probably something, and what I'd like to ask is uh, to anyone who wants to start a community is how good is your community model? And it, Something it's good if it's uh, like predictable, provides like guidance to uh, potential members, or prevents uh, discussions, or uh, helps to make decisions. I mean, there are all sorts of criteria that help uh, define and drive a community. That's our uh, our experience. And one thing I must say is that, and it came from what you said earlier on, um, a community is not homogeneous. It's not something. Um, uh, Tony, you can't say a community, I think. I mean, we right. live that from the, uh, from the hard side. And I can say that we have many communities inside our community, and even some people have never talked to each other. Exactly, and uh, Jim was talking about this earlier in the day, the, the fact that there are many different communities that are 
culturally and geographically and language based around uh, Linux and uh, that um, maybe they don't have so much to say to one another, but they're all part of the bigger picture. Did you want to add to that? Well, we, uh, the, the, it's difficult to, to manage that. Um, well, uh, perhaps, Sander, you, you, have, you have a go at this one. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we have people all over the globe, uh, obviously, um, uh, ranging from Asia, Europe, uh, US, Canada, um, you name it. Um, Even the penguins in Australia. Even the penguins in Australia. Actually, we've got an Australian board member now, um, and this is one of the reasons why we had to shift our uh, board meeting time, um, because it's not very nice to be at a meeting at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, so, um, yeah, if, if you look at our communities, uh, they're able to communicate because we, we live and breathe on our mailing lists. Everything happens on a mailing list through email. Um, and the reason why our organization works so well is because it doesn't matter what time zone you're in, you just respond later. Um, it, it means that there is a bit more latency, but everybody gets a voice. Um, and that's also represented in our voting system. Uh, if we run a vote uh, on an issue, uh, it typically lasts uh, 72 hours, giving everyone a chance to participate. Good. So, so this is part of the governance of a community and how uh, the uh, formal and informal policies impact. So a couple of us have talked uh, in this uh, initial session about um, uh, the business aspects of community. So, so we've seen in the, in the past decade uh, going from individual projects that were not profit oriented to the emergence of business models, uh, building on open source, uh, and also the emergence of the foundations, which were a little more structured and have their own governance. And now we have this issue where communities can help enable business. Uh, Mike, um, I think that's an important piece of Eclipse and the way that you work with your ecosystem. So maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, so at Eclipse, as I mentioned earlier, we're, uh, we have both a business uh, community and as well as an open source project community. And the, um, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking and studying about how do you go about creating business ecosystems around, um, around open source platforms. And I think, uh, you know, there's no absolute one way to do it. I think I can point out a couple of best practices um, that might be of value uh, to, to you. And so just a couple of things to think about is, um, if you want to create a business ecosystem, there's there's you know four things you have to get right. You have to have some kind of licensing model to share the intellectual property. You have to have some kind of vendor neutral governance model so that all of the participants feel that they can they can they can participate on an equal footing. Um, there has to be some kind of development process um, so that the activities of all of the individuals and or companies involved are actually coordinated and achieve some kind of um, useful result. And um, there has to be some kind of technical architecture that allows the uh, the technologies that are being built by this, these disparate groups to come together and do something useful. Um, and one of the things I'd like to point out is, you know, there's, there's lots of business ecosystems out there. Many of them are, are led by commercial companies. You know, Microsoft actually does a great job of building ecosystems around it, it, its platforms. Um, but open source has um, some key advantages when you look at um, trying to build these business ecosystems because you can come to Eclipse or Apache or Linux or OW2 and out of the box you get licensing, governance, development process and technical architecture. And you don't have to reinvent all of that um, as, as part of participating in creating a business ecosystem. So that's one of the things in... in um, um, in general, that open source does very, very well. There's some other things that you know I, I think Eclipse does particularly well, you know, related to example like the modularity of the platform, which really helps enable participation and lowers the barriers to entry. But all of these are just variations of um, setting up the right kind of structure and then doing a very laissez-faire, let the community, let the business uh, business ecosystem evolve, and basically try to stay out of the way. Um, so, uh, would anyone else like to uh, add to that? Uh? Yeah, 
I can give some, I'll, I'm going to answer this by giving three numbers. 24.8, 10.8 billion, and 500. Those are just some of the business benefits from Linux. So 24.8% 24, 24 is the compound annual growth rate of the Linux uh, server marketplace, which for anyone who checked their stock portfolio lately, that's very good in this economy. Uh, 10.8 billion is the cost in US dollars to rewrite the Linux operating system. So anybody who's interested in creating a new device, in uh, deploying software, in providing any kind of technology service would have to spend $10.8 billion or go buy some proprietary product in order to do that. And then 500, the S&P 500. This year, Red Hat was actually included in the key stock index in the New York Stock Exchange, the S&P 500, for the first time. A company entirely built on Linux and open source. So th those are three pretty compelling reasons. And I can give many, many more uh, why uh, open source and Linux benefit business. And I think those models are fairly obvious. Right. So uh, but, but now the next question that, that relates to this is uh, for Historically, individuals would come and contribute to projects. They would pick a project they wanted to work on, either because the application interested them or because they wanted to learn the associated technology. And as we grow and have more complex projects, and as some of these projects um, are more limited because they're commercially based and run by a company which may in fact have venture investors, in some of these cases makes it harder, do you think, for people to join a community or around the product? Or do you think that there are different ways that that's happening? Nick, maybe you can take that. I actually think it's the opposite. And I think there's a lot of confusion about you know, how the different models for building a commercial enterprise on top of an open source solution. I mean, there's many companies like Red Hat are doing very, very well entering the the S&P 500 um, building a business around an open source project. So uh, I, I think it's how you define the ecosystem. And, and, and originally, most uh, projects, you just had committers, and that was it. But as the ecosystems grow larger, you have so many opportunities for participation. You know, you could have code committers, but you could also have people who help with software Q&A, uh, documentation review, testing. Uh, uh, feedback on forums, and they extend your community in so many ways. So I look at Jaspersoft, for example, many people have taken our LGPL products and embedded them into theirs and built commercial, valuable solutions around them. And we, the commercial side of Jaspersoft, have done the same thing. In our open core model, we take the open source version and we add some other stuff to it to add value that we can sell. And anybody is free to do that. Lots of other, in, and, and that's the way all of these projects yeah. work. So it's a, it's a very powerful ecosystem uh, that just builds. Right. right. I, I would actually pose it the opposite. You can't create a technology business today without open source. And I'll give one example. How many people here have an iPhone? Lottie, I see you out there. The most closed platform out there. Go into the settings section, go into about, scroll all the way down to legal, and you will see Richard Stallman's name in there. You will see three, four employees of the Linux Foundation's name in there. You will see multiple open source licenses, including the GPL. You cannot build anything meaningful today without open source. So I think all of those communities, that, and, and it's many, just to create a closed platform, <laughs> And, 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 and even better, one of the things that I've observed is that some of the traditional proprietary companies are adopting open source practices. So if you look back at earlier versions of Windows, they were just released one day. But now what we have is the idea that they release early and release often, and that they actually use the community to do a lot of the uh, early testing, and and you actually have a chance as an end user to, to feed back in, into that. Uh, I think so these open source practices uh, are, are being uh, influential across the whole spectrum of software development. I know you're supposed to be the moderator and ask the question, but who's left 
when you, when you call traditional software companies? Because every software company I know is involved in open source in one way or another. <laughs> well, you know, I, I thought, I, I, I think that too. But then I go into Oracle Open World's exhibit hall, and there are all these little companies that build these vertical niche products. And you go into some of these specialized industries, uh, in, uh, and, and people are still, in fact, creating uh, proprietary products. That's going to go away. Yeah, but even today, Oracle has three pro running, th leading three projects at Eclipse. They have 40 or 50 developers right. working well, it's not, at Eclipse. It's not Oracle. It's all these people who are writing proprietary products that run on top of Oracle. So anyway, we have just a couple of minutes to wrap up. Uh, and so um, I think uh, one of the things um, I'd like to hear some thoughts on is um, Given that um, open source is everywhere and it's, it's growing into all these hardware platforms, um, what advice do you have for people who are trying to build community around new uh, projects or existing projects? What are the some, what are the for each of you maybe one key lesson that you can offer to uh, people who are interested in in improving their communities? So let's start with Cedric and we'll come back. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question because, uh, of course, now you don't have a, a software strategy without looking at open source anyway. Um, what, what we see ourselves, and even more so with uh, the Open Source Alliance now, as um, an enabler of uh, open source strategy. Um, we don't expect that our members, uh, we don't expect our members to be 100% open source companies, but we expect them to have to f pursue at least for one part of their strategy an open source strategy. And yeah. we expect them to be uh, clear about their open source strategy. And I really understand, I like the discussion about free software or commercial open source, but yeah. the more we understand there is an evolution and there are, we can identify the difference and where those members fit, uh, the less we would have these kind of religious discussions which are completely endless and lead nowhere. So the, the key, I would say, the key uh, piece of advice I would give to a potential member would be to understand what they want to do with OW2 and, uh, and OSA, and uh, we, because we see ourselves more as a shopping mall where members can open shop there and attract vend uh, customers. So we, we ena ena enable them. Now we can enable them on a global, uh, no, completely global uh, uh, scale. But if they don't have a strategy, <laughs> it's going to be a waste of time. They need to have a strategy. Okay. Thank you. So my advice to any project is make it easy for people and in, in companies and individuals to consume your code, to use the code. And I'll give you a specific example. Two weeks ago, I was on a panel exactly like this in Amsterdam with some of the top wireless manufacturers in the world. And they asked, how do we get the wireless industry to commit more code to open source? And my answer was, I don't care. Don't commit any code, just use the code. Because when people use the code, they always come back and contribute at some point. The best example is IBM. They did not invest a billion dollars in Linux just because they're nice guys. They are nice. I see right there. <laughs> You're cool. Uh, they did it because they got a $10 billion operating system back. Make it easy for people to get their hands on the code, choose a license that will help proliferate that code, and your community will be successful. Great, thank you. Nick? Yeah, I, I, I want to echo a portion of that, and this may sound funny coming from a commercial open source company, but I would say choose the most liberal open source license that you can in, that's in line with what you're trying to do and what your goals and objectives are, because that's what's going to significantly enable that proliferation. If you can use the LGPL, by all means do it because you will get much greater adoption. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll echo Jim and Nick, um, who are actually giving examples that um, are true to the ASF and why the ASF is so successful. Um, the last thing um, that I would want to add is, uh, as a follow-up on not doing license uh, proliferation, don't do your own foundation, don't do your own project uh, with a new legal framework and everything else because it's already out there, use it. Man, he just said exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> now you're stuck. Well, it's no, it's, it's, I just want to reiterate it. I mean, if you're, if you're starting your own uh, project in community, um, it's fine if you go to SourceForge or something like that and get started. But 
before you go off and start your own foundation, like seriously, seriously think about whether or not you can fit into one of the existing ones because there's lots of there's lots of choice up here. I'm not just saying pick Eclipse. There's Apache, Linux, whatever. There's lots of choice that exists today. And for crying out loud, if somebody suggests to write your own license, just say no. Okay. And I would add one more uh, to this, which is uh, communities need care. And what that means is that uh, you can get into uh, lengthy discussions and arguments, and you need to put in an effort to sustain your community, to make it work effectively, to grow it, to keep champions who will see that it thrives, and uh, moderators who can uh, resolve discussions. You need at least a limited amount of uh, governance and policy so that um, uh, everybody can, in fact, work together toward the same goal. So with that, I wanted to thank uh, our panelists here for uh, uh, their help, and I want to thank all of you for uh, staying till the end of a, a long day, and uh, we appreciate that. So uh, with that, uh, we'll conclude, and uh, we'll all be back here tomorrow for another fun day.